Okay. You were telling the story before the phone <laughs> ring <laughs> about uh, Central America. Yes. Quite a, an important uh, reach out that you were a part of. That's right. We recorded uh, the Indian languages, Chol, Mixteco, Zapoteco, Mam, Maya Quiche, uh, Tzotzil, and then when I came back, I attended La Sierra College, that was the name of it at that time, and I recorded in the radio station over there, one of the foreign exchange students, uh, Peter Dawa from Africa, so we recorded Swahili. Altogether, we recorded the gospel in the languages of about 52 million people. Now, that's not how many people will listen to our records, but that's how many people spoke the languages that we recorded. But I turned 20 in Guatemala, just over the border in Guatemala. Mm. And we prayed that, because it was like culture shock, you know, we bought gasoline and in liters and we paid for them in pesos and we drove kilometers and it was a completely different uh, experience. <laughs> and we prayed that if we were ever in need, if we were in trouble, that help would be nearby. Well, um, I will tell you just one of the many experiences probably the, the most spectacular one, I believe. What is that year? This was, uh, let's see, I was 21 at that time, and I was born in 41, so it would be, what? 62? 62, 1962. So the <coughs> guerrilla war has already started in Guatemala, because they had the longest guerrilla <laughs> war in Central America. We were told if we ever saw any soldiers, we should stop. We mm -hmm. shouldn't try to escape or anything. And we did see some soldiers, but they didn't bother us. Um, we were told that the best way to get back to Guatemala from Honduras was directly. Usually the, the Pan American Highway goes down through El Salvador. Yes. And so <coughs> they told us that an American company had built this new road and it had bridges and everything. And so we thought, well, that would be faster, better way to go. So we started out on this road, and it was a nice road. It wasn't paved. It was a gravel road, but it was nice. And we would wave at the people that were walking along the road. If they waved back, we felt good. If they glared at us, we didn't feel so good. You know, we were just kept on going. But it got dark. Mm. And ahead of us on the left were some lights. Mm. And so as we approached that, we saw it was a brand new service station. Concrete and new pumps, and it was an American company. They had American companies in Honduras at that time. Maybe still do, I don't know. And right after we passed that, we heard a noise under the truck. We had a four-wheel drive truck with a camper on the back. And so we stopped, and we had a big um, spotlight that plugged into the cigarette lighter and we looked under and here the frame assembly was coming loose from the spring assembly. Oh my. There were four rivets. Three of them had broken. The fourth one was stretched. It was almost a major breakdown. Wow. We felt that was an answer to prayer. We turned right around. We went back to the service station where there were lights. <coughs> we caught a ride back to San Pedro Sula where we bought some machine bolts. They're <coughs> extra strong and they have finer threads. We came back and we caught a ride. Somebody helped us go both ways. We repaired that and then we headed back on the road to Guatemala. <laughs> Within a few miles, we came to the end of that road mm. and it became a Jeep road. Oh. Steep Jeep road. Mm. And we found ourselves sliding down that road into a stream bed and then bouncing through that and on the other side we couldn't get back. So we thought, well, we've got four wheel drive, let's keep on going. So this took three days to get from Honduras to Guatemala. We called it the Devil's Highway. It would have been a lot better to go through El Salvador. It would have been a lot better. <laughs> we came to a stake in the road. It said Honduras, Guatemala. There were no border guards. There was it was in the middle of nowhere. We came across the Indian Mayan ruins of Copan. Yes. And we ex we explored those. <coughs> 
One day we came across a truck that was buried to its axles in mud, and there was no way we could get around it. There was, there was a truck <coughs> of men from Honduras that were on their way to Guatemala on this road, and they were between us and this buried truck. So we told them we had a winch, and we could winch that truck out of the mud. So they, we all backed up to a place where we could pass. It was a narrow road. In fact, there was one place where it tipped so much that my, my uh, two partners got out and watched me drive through, and it tipped so much that the left rear tire lifted off of the ground, mm. and there was a cliff over there. Mm. They came back down, and we kept going. <clears throat> so these men backed up. We faced that truck, and we winched it out of the mud, but we still couldn't get by it. And so we built a road. We dug away from the side of the mountain and threw it over the edge and widened the road there with the help of these men from Guatemala or from Honduras. So there was another answer to that prayer. Help would be nearby when we needed it. They helped mm -hmm. us to build this road. We winched that truck out over the new road and then we all went between you it. You provided and help and you received provided help. help. <clears throat> well, one night we were on this really bad road and the road went downhill and into some darkness and there was a fence across the road mm. and it was one of these gates where there's where the post goes into a wire loop yes. and the front the top of it goes into a loop and you can get through that gate by just lifting the loops and and there was a river there mm. a 200 foot river mm. with rapids mm. and we could see where the road went down into the water but we couldn't see where it came out on the other side uh oh but there was a campfire on the other side. There were some men over there, and we thought they might be able to help us. So we walked across with our clothes in this river. How deep was it? It was about 200 feet across, and it was rapids. I got behind a boulder, and the water was bo boiling over both sides of the boulder. I mean, I w it was up to my waist. and. <coughs> I was almost afraid to try to get out of there because it was so much water coming on both sides. I was safe behind the boulder. <coughs> Excuse me. So we walked over there and the men told us that the road did come out. It came up at an angle. So that's why we couldn't see it from the other side. So one of them volunteered to go with us back to the truck. Mm. We gave him our spotlight. We had to go upstream to where the Ford was because there's no way we could go through where the rapids were, and he got us through to the other side. Mm. <coughs> well, it wasn't deep, as deep to the waist where it you crossed. It was to the waist. Where, yeah. where you crossed. Right. So well, the water was inside the truck. Well, it was touching the truck, and we could feel it moving the truck. Mm. As we were going across, we could see it, and we thought, you know, if this goes down here, we're going to lose everything. We might even lose our lives. Mm -hmm. We got to safety, <coughs> and we felt that that was an answer to prayer, that the, those men was there. We hadn't seen any campfire anywhere before, and here was one of them willing to walk across with us. Well, when we got to safety, we noticed something else that had happened. This was right in the middle of the rainy season. Now, in the, in the rainy season in, in Central America, it rains every day. Yes. In fact, sometimes several times a day. Yes. And it rains hard. <coughs> the first day came, there was no rain. All night long, there was no rain. The second day came, and there was no rain. The clouds were there. There was lightning. All day long, no rain. All night long, no rain. Mm -hmm. Third day came, and the third night came. Three days and three nights without any rain in the middle of the rainy season in Guatemala and Honduras. While you were on this unexpected While we were on this unexpected road. road you well, had it a different name for the road. What was it? We called it the Devil's Highway. <laughs> the Devil's Highway. <laughs> uh, luckily, there were no toll. No. Okay. When we got to safety, it rained. Mm. Three days' worth of rain. Wow. When we got to Guatemala City, the people there in the mission noticed that they hadn't had three days of rain either, and the water was boiling up over the curbs. It was coming down so hard. Wow. That strengthened my faith as a young man. Mm. 
the answers to prayer that we experienced. That, not just that one, but others too on that trip. And you were 20. You had just turned 20. I had just turned 20. <coughs> this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I was 21 when I was in Central America as mm -hmm. a missionary. Mm -hmm. But those stories will come at a different time. <laughs> and what would you share about your family life? Well, I have three sons. Um, my oldest son is a truck driver for the medical center. <coughs> my middle son is a firefighter paramedic and captain with San Bernardino County Fire Department. And my youngest son is a computer programmer and he designs websites for mm. people. Mm. And uh, we all live in Forest Falls, California, which is on the back road to Big Bear Lake. And um, I've lived up there for 43 years, almost 44. So you mm -hmm. are able to see your, your three sons almost on a daily basis? We, we, almost on a daily basis. Praise the Lord. Care. That's a blessing. I also have three sons. Oh, really? Yes. Now <laughs> one is in Texas and two are here. But I'm praying that we will be close by. Well, I have to tell you something about three sons since you mentioned that. Yes. I felt that I was joining a unique club mm -hmm. uh, because my supervisor was uh, Oliver Jacques, director of university relations, and he had three sons. The administrator of the medical center, uh, Mr. Dick Way, had three sons. The head chaplain, uh, Charles Teal, had three sons. And so I felt like I was joining an exclusive club when I became the father of three sons. Well, I joined that club <laughs> a little bit later after yes. you. Uh -huh. yes. And this, uh, this is the context that has been making you who you are for 45 years. Now, mm -hmm. these are the bases and the foundations and where you're nourished. Mm -hmm. What else can you tell us about the professional life and the fulfillment of that vision <coughs> or of that commitment, of, that, of those feelings that God put in your heart when you were 10 years old? Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to emphasize that. I was 10. I played catch with my twin brother with an orange because we lived across the street from an orange grove. <coughs> we had a little fort up in the uh, attic of our garage and we had a ladder up there and we had a sign on that that said no girls allowed. <laughs> I was 10. I was 10 years old when I had that experience. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> and what kind of bike did you have when, when you were going to cross the Redlands Boulevard? It was a Schwinn. Mm. It was a Schwinn. We, we, we got Schwinn bicycles for a uh, birthday present. Do you remember the color? Do I remember what? The color of the bicycle. Uh, it was yellow. I okay. think it had some stripes on it. Okay. Yeah, but uh, they were nice bicycles. Well, my career <coughs> started as the assistant to the director of university relations. Then, after a year, I moved to the medical center from the administration building and I became the community relations officer. And I was the community relations officer for a few years, and then I became the director of community relations for the medical center. Altogether, I uh, worked in public relations for about 32 years, and I've been the historian now for the past uh, 13 years. But as the director of community relations, um, I've I believe this is a fact. I'm not meaning to make this sound like uh, bragging, but it's. I think it's a fact that I've had more experience with the world news media mm -hmm. than any other Seventh-day Adventist. Mm. And that's because of the work that has been done, newsworthy work, starting with the infant heart transplant program. My first day with Baby Faye was 36 hours long. Hmm. I had to take my phone off the hook to uh, be able to go to sleep. Um, one day <coughs> I made three trips to Los Angeles. Hmm. The first one was to do an interview on Good Morning America. The second one was to do an interview with Network 9 Australia, that was by satellite, from an ABC station in Los Angeles. So I did an interview with ABC while I was there. And the last one that day was another trip, third trip, a debate on CNN. Mm. 
but then that led to the successful infant to infant heart transplant program and that led to a lot of national stories to begin with but then after the after there was so many of them the national interest stopped but local interest continued so we would have people come here from Canada and the Canadian news media would be interested in those stories and then after that we had something called the anencephalic infant donor protocol where we were trying to get donors from anencephalic babies. These are babies that are born without a brain. Yes. And so there was a, and that was a controversy. And um, we actually did one transplant, uh, baby Paul Hulk was, um, his, his donor was also a Canadian and um, she had anencephaly, or mm -hmm. she was an anencephalic baby. And he was only three hours of age Mm -hmm. youngest person in the world even to this day to get a successful organ transplant of any kind mm -hmm. and the NBC movie uh, of the week featured that story and mm -hmm. it was entitled Heart of a Child it's the it's the most emotional television movie I have ever seen mm -hmm. and because I cooperated with them they thanked me in a very unusual way mm -hmm. I was watching this movie and while they were in the medical center supposedly um, there was a page and it said, and this was in the background, see, probably most people don't know this, but it said, Dick Schaefer, call the operator please, Dick Schaefer, call the operator. <laughs> <laughs> that was their way of thanking me uh -oh. for participating. They inserted in this. They inserted that, it was in the background, yeah. Good. <clears throat> but then we did the uh, proton treatment center and that was controversial. Uh, you know, there were people who said it wouldn't work. Uh, they, there were some people who said it would be a white elephant that um, in fact there was a story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal uh, that acknowledged the successful use of protons in treating cancer at the uh, Harvard Cyclotron Laboratory but in halfway through they called our synchrotron a contraption hmm. and at the end they interviewed somebody who was from a university medical center and they asked him would you recommend such a facility for your hospital? And he said, no way. Uh, he's the one that said it'd be a white elephant. He said he feared for Loma Linda's future patients and the false hope that they would receive. Well, 16 or 17 later, years later, there was another story on the Wall Street Journal. This time it's all positive. Hmm. They talked about the second machine after more than 10 years went into Massachusetts General Hospital. Which so it was positive when it was in Massachusetts General Hospital, yeah, but it was well negative when it was at Loma Linda. Well, the whole story was positive this time. Mm -hmm. It was under the theme that uh, proton therapy is America's best kept secret in the war against cancer. Mm -hmm. They talked about another one. There were two that were working. There were two more that were under construction, one at MD Anderson Comprehensive Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And in gratitude for that story, one of our doctors, one of our uh, patients, who was a physician from Orange County, wrote a letter to the editor, which was published in the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And his name was Terry Websick. <clears throat> he said he thought that the readers ought to know what his qualifications were for making the statement that he made. <clears throat> he said, I'm a Harvard University School of Medicine trained physician. <clears throat> I'm a cancer biology researcher funded by the National Institutes of Health. I teach cancer biology to student physicians. He said, I came down with prostate cancer in 2002. He did his due diligence. He didn't use that word, but he talked about it. He talked about all the various ways of treating prostate cancer and named institutions, including mm. his own institution, mm. University of California at Irvine. <clears throat> he said, my insurance would cover whatever I chose. He said, I chose proton therapy at Loma Linda University Medical Center. Well, after being uh, the only one in the world for more than 10 years, there's more than 10 of them now in operation, another nine or 10 in the planning stages. People who once rejected the idea are building them now. So it's... Um, you have seen the whole change. <clears throat> I've seen it all change, yes, but that was, that included interviews on my part uh, on like uh, the Voice of America around the world, you know, by shortwave radio Yes. Uh, at like 1.30 a.m. I mean, uh, a lot of the interviews I have done 
have been in the wee hours. I don't think administration even knows what all my, my people and I have done after hours. In fact, one morning about 4 a.m., I was so tired that I was incoherent. I apologized to the reporter, and he said, that's all right, I understand. In fact, the page operator who had paged me said, are you okay? Mm -hmm. But it worked, and I prayed over the years that the work we did with the news media, you see, in Testimonies, Volume 7, page 103 and 104, <coughs> Ellen G. White says, the reason we're in this business is to be a witness for God. And she gives four ways to do that. To relieve the sick and afflicted, awaken a spirit of inquiry, advance reform, and disseminate light. My prayer has been that someday the work that we did here with the news media and the name recognition of Loma Linda will help to awaken a spirit of inquiry. And the proton patients, you see, the, in the original sanitariums, we had the patients here for weeks. Mm. We did perform surgery, we did deliver babies, but most of the patients were what we call rest cure patients. They would come here for weeks and we would have a greater influence on their lives. This is at the beginning <coughs> of our history yes. as an institution in the 1905 era. Yes, and with all of the Seventh-day Adventist sanitariums. And then what happened was we had a department of fever therapy and we treated, successfully treated, gonorrhea and tertiary syphilis without drugs, with fever therapy. Mm. And what did that in was penicillin. When we got penicillin, the people who paid for health care said that hydrotherapy is labor intensive. We'll pay for a shot of penicillin. So we segued into the practice of medicine which is what we're doing today. And now we've even, here in Loma Linda, we've gotten into trauma, organ transplantation, and proton therapy. But the interesting thing about proton patients is they're here for weeks, mm. just like they were in the sanitarium days. I see. They see what happens in Loma Linda on Fridays. You know, we roll up the sidewalks. Everything shuts down. They're invited to go to our churches. They're invited to become members of the Drayson Center, the wellness facility on campus. And so they love us, and they know we're Seventh-day Adventists. Um, so I'm, I again pray that the Holy Spirit will use the work that we do here to awaken a spirit of inquiry. Yes. That boy, that 10-year-old boy with his swing bicycle mm -hmm. has been spreading the message. Yes. Now, I know that you have your own values. You have been representing the institution, and usually the values of your own would be the same as the institution. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to talk about those values, and perhaps the few times, or perhaps the one time, when values have been in conflict? Let me be more specific. You mentioned this transformation from the more natural, low-tech, approaches mm -hmm. to like hydrotherapy and fever therapy that you described, <laughs> to a more uh, allopathic medicine, drug related interven pharmaceutical interventions mm -hmm. in medicine. What do you think is the highest value? Because you mentioned the value of economics, mm -hmm. which is the interest of the institution and also the uh, interest of the whole group because the resources are limited mm -hmm. so you have to use the money in a manner that is wiser to help mm -hmm. the more people within the system mm -hmm. now but but there's a price to be paid what are other values that are being compromised and how are you feeling about it this is now you as a person okay now you're going to get some more personal stuff yes please um, I use hydrotherapy myself. If I get a cold or a sore throat, I'll put a cold compress. Uh, my grandmother used to put fomentations on my chest when I was a young boy. Um, I prefer that way, but there are some things that uh, those old methods would not touch. Like, for example, 
uh, one of my employees had uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis com compromised by a hole in the septum of her heart. Mm. And she suffered twice. They told her that if she would get it a third time, that she could die from it. So that meant that she had to have open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And they repaired the hole in the septum of her heart. So there are some things that need the technology that we have today. And trauma is a good example of that. But we still have a department of uh, rehabilitation. And so we still do hydrotherapy there. I have experienced it myself. Uh, and I have seen it. I've seen fomentations used at a distance. We have hydrocholator pads now, which are full of silicone gel instead of the wool, that, so it doesn't have to be changed as often, but we still do the cold in between. And so we have hot and cold, hot and cold. And that increases the circulation of the blood. It also increases the white blood count. There was a lot of science that was in that. And I'll tell you a personal dream that I have had since 1967. Mm. See, I started working here in 66. On July 9, 1967, we moved 125 patients from our old hospital on the hill into the new university hospital. And the original sanitarium that was built here as a luxury hotel in, in, in uh, 1888, we purchased in 1905, it became a fire trap. In fact, the top two floors were taken off of it hmm. at some time. But the rest of it was still used until 1967. It was called the Sanitarium Annex. And it was the home of the School of Nursing. And it was where the uh, occupational therapy program started. On the top level? It, well, that was started in the, uh, in the cafeteria, actually. Mm. The kitchen area is where occupational therapy started. But they used the dining room in physical therapy and so it was used, and, and the classrooms were for the School of Nursing. But in 1967, when everything moved to the new building, including the School of Nursing, that original sanitarium was taken down. Uh, my wife and I went through that building with a security officer and uh, uh, an elderly lady who was a graduate of the School of Nursing, and she would say, she would point out things as we went through the original sanitarium. I wish I could do it again, I didn't know at that time that I was going to someday become the historian. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I started fantasizing about rebuilding that mm. someday. Mm. And it has never been used. That property is a lawn. So when I became the historian, I talked to Dr. Richard Hart, who was the brand new uh, chancellor at that time. And I said, because I was thinking about ways of raising money to rebuild the sanitarium. I says, I don't want to try to raise money if that's not in harmony with administration's thinking. He says, no, that would be in harmony with our thinking. <clears throat> now, over the years, I've thought about being a lifestyle medicine conditioning center and a sanitarium mm -hmm. where we used hydrotherapy. and. We have people on campus who have been trained in the use of hydrotherapy. They would know what to do. And that would hopefully expose our student physicians and our student nurses to our roots. And I've mentioned this to some of the people in the School of Nursing, and this was years ago, but it was mentioned to me that at that time anyway, they said they would like their student nurses to rotate through that facility. Where, where is this facility precisely? To it's. Uh, it's a lawn now. We started our campus tour on that site. Okay, so there's no building there. There's no building there. Got it. I, I, I thought when you mm -hmm. meant, uh, I thought you meant that the building was still there. No. I was a bit confused. No, it was taken down in 1967. But nothing has been built on the nothing area. Nothing has That's been what built you meant. there. And um, I mentioned this to one of our proton patients who was a, a an architect, and he I gave him photographs, mm. and we have the original sign that we saw that's hanging yes, over the Del yes. Webb Library. We took <laughs> measurements off of that and we extrapolated and he drew uh, elevations hmm. of it. So I mean, so you have a done, drawing already. We don't even know how much it would cost to do that. It may be a fantasy. It may not ever happen, but I'm telling you, you 
this is personal. This mm -hmm. I think would take us back to our roots. And I would it be a railroad to the moon? Right. <laughs> and I would like to see it. The the stairway that went down to the train station, I'd like to there were hundred and nineteen steps that went up the north face to the north entrance of the sanitarium. I'd like to see that rebuilt. And um, our president, Dr. Richard Hart, is is really into our history too. And he wants to turn the east end of the hill into what he calls a legacy village. And I like the word legacy. That's the name of my book. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, But that's the name he chose for this village. And he wants to restore the cottages as they were in patient care. And our imaginations could think of things that we could do. We could have mannequins that were in beds, you know, and we could have, I have a red heat lamp that I've already uh, donated to the Department of Archives and Special Collections. The heat lamp was invented by Dr. Kate Lindsay, who, who was trained in the Battle Creek Sanitarium. As far as we know, she never came to Loma Linda, but our School of Nursing faculty had such a high regard for her that they talked the Board of Trustees into naming the women's dormitory after her in 1936. Since 1936, it's been the Kate Lindsay Hall. Then when that building came down, they built a new women's dormitory. They renamed it. It's Kate Lindsay Hall, too. But <clears throat> he wants to build a dentist's office and a doctor's office, dated 1905. And he has a friend uh, who has a pharmacy. He and his wife uh, started collecting antiques, and they kind of got into pharmaceutical antiques. Their pharmacy has been estimated to be worth about $12 million. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hart has been negotiating with them. I don't know where that stands right now, either as a gift or as a uh, some kind of a, a good buy. But I've been there with Dr. Hart on two occasions, and one time I asked the man, I said, what year is this pharmacy? He said, 1905. <laughs> That's our year. And I said, do you have Dr. Williams' pink pills for pale people? And he did. And he went and got them and showed them to me. They were wafers, little pink wafers. Huh. And uh, so that would, would show our church constituency that we value our heritage. Yes. <clears throat> but you also say that it will have treatment facilities for the original plans that the sanitarium had, wouldn't it? Yeah, so it will also contain a uh, hydrotherapy facility. That is if we built the <clears throat> excuse me, if we rebuilt the sanitarium according to my dream. Well I I my as I dream your dream with you, <clears throat> I like the idea of combining the two. It would have hydrotherapy, yes. Mm -hmm. And you see, one of the one of the things we have to consider is that no insurance will pay for that. Mm. So we would only be able to serve the rich unless we had an endowment fund, which would require raising money to help so that it, so that other people could go there too. But there would be cases that that couldn't touch, like like my assistant, for example, if somebody came in with subacute bacterial endocarditis in a hole in the heart, you know, it would not be able to help them. Yeah, we need to remember and be reminded that <clears throat> even the miracles that Jesus did of all of the people he healed, as far as we know, they all die. Mm -hmm. So death is part of the human experience yes. until the second coming and the restoration of time. But while we are here, we have two roads. Helpful living and lifestyle approaches that include hydrotherapy mm -hmm. that are slow and present values of simplicity mm -hmm. and the technologically more sophisticated, as we will call them, and so-called advanced mm -hmm. ways of proton treatment and miracle medicine and interventions. Mm -hmm. But these two are two different kinds of values. Mm -hmm. and they both represent imperfect approaches. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this uh, heritage of the university, it will be good to, it is more friendly 
to the biblical stories to think of hydrotherapy mm -hmm. than to think of proton treatment mm -hmm. because it's so far away one technology yes. from the other. And there's nothing, there's no particular moral value in being simple. Mm -hmm. The value is in the package, yes. the whole package of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What has been the value that has uh, motivated or troubled you the most as you have been representing Loma Linda University? Well, the thing that has, has been a blessing is to see evidence of providence. I have found evidence of providence throughout our history, including today. Hmm. And starting four years before Ellen White and John Burton even came to Loma Linda. Hmm. Uh, I mentioned in the lecture the, uh, the fact that the Lumland Association placed their first advertisement in the Citrograph, which meant that Loma Linda didn't match what Ellen White had saw a year later as unoccupied property for sale for much less than its original cost. And I found some new history nine days after Ellen White wrote in her journal about the tent-like canopy of trees the Lumland Association placed their first advertisement in the Citrograph saying we're now opening our facility. I think if Ellen White and John Burden had known about that, we would know about it today. But I was checking up on one of my historian predecessors and I found something that he didn't find. And that was a picture, nine days after she wrote about the tent-like canopy of trees, of Loma Linda's tent-like canopy of trees, hmm. published. I mean, it's all documented her writing in her journal and the publishing in the Citrograph. And now the Citrograph is... was a newspaper that was popular throughout Southern California. It was uh, from Redlands. I see. But clear up to, to, to today, on the Proton Treatment Center, it is one of the most internationally peer-reviewed research projects in history. Hmm. And we didn't pay for it. Up to 120 scientists came from Sweden, Switzerland, Japan, the former Soviet Union, and from across the United States, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, Harvard Cyclotron Laboratory, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Brookhaven, Los Alamos, and Argonne, to mention a few. They paid their own transportation costs and volunteered their time to be part of this program. They saw this as a major advancement for mankind. Dr. Slater, James M. Slater, the namesake of the James M. Slater, MD, Proton Treatment and Research Center felt that it was providential. And you know, even the construction company, the man who was the superintendent of the construction project for McCarthy, talks about it being a spiritual experience mm, to, to build, build that, to mm. build it mm. with such a unique facility. So um, we see providence, and, and this is something that I have looked for. Uh, and something that has impressed me about the entire history of this place, we have seen Providence. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we've done everything right. You know, I have been an invitee to the board for 16 years, and I have seen them pray to begin their board meetings, and I've seen them end their board meetings with prayer. But sometimes they've had to change their minds, like in 1961, for example. Mm. They voted to consolidate the School of Medicine in Los Angeles, and they had good reasons to do that. Four deans of four major schools of medicine in this country came to Loma Linda and went to Los Angeles, and they evaluated the clinical facilities, and they were forced to recommend that we consolidate the School of Medicine in Los Angeles. That's what science and <laughs> academics said. Because of the importance of clinical experience and that huge Los Angeles County General Hospital. When that was opened in December of 1933, it was the largest hospital in the world under one roof. And we shared that with the University of Southern California. So they had good reasons, and, and we had good reasons to follow their advice because they were all connected with the Council on Medical Education of the American Medical Association. That accredits that that accredited is a license to open it. The School of Medicine. But before that decision was implemented, they reversed themselves. And the writings of Ellen G. White. The board it is. Pardon? The board it is reversed. The board itself. of trustees 
voted to reverse their decision and to consolidate the School of Medicine here in Loma Linda. Do you know the insight of that story? Well, the, the, the um, university counselors were in favor of it, of moving to Loma Linda. The alumni were in favor of moving to Loma Linda. And then there has been about a thousand pages of writings from Ellen G. White. Mm -hmm. And the alumni called the attention to the Board of Trustees about that. And so before that decision was implemented, they reversed themselves. So and that's why we're here in Loma Linda today. The words of Ellen G. White were being spoken by the followers of the church That's right. in order to revive the original vision. Mm -hmm. And I tell the students when I'm teaching classes here, I say we would not be in this room tonight if it were not for Ellen G. White. Mm -hmm. We owe her a debt of gratitude. Indeed. We need to give credit where credit is due. Indeed, indeed. I call Ellen G. White my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I quote her often and I use her writings a lot in my personal and professional lives as a professor of religion. Mm -hmm. So I share the feeling of gratitude mm -hmm. and admiration for this mm -hmm. woman. And there's a vision that she passed on mm -hmm. and this vision goes to our students. They are the ones that represent the institution. They are the ones that receive the torch. You and I have different ages, but you and I are already on the end of looking at the end. Mm -hmm. Our students are here to carry the torch and continue the message that was given originally at that established this institution. What would you say to our students? What values should they embrace and make part of their living as they study and as they, as they take this class? Well. A famous person once said, and, and one of our doctors reported, uh, repeated this to me, God heals, we just dress the wounds. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what our place is in this. And then historically, one of the strengths of the Seventh-day Adventist medical work is our acknowledgement that the human body is the temple of God. And that was new. That no other group of people, including the health reformers back in the 1860s, have picked up on that. So that makes it uh, even more compelling what we're doing here today. Hmm. We need to be a witness for God. And our alumni have done some tremendous things I can think of. The um, Judkins technique of computer assisted percutaneous transfemoral selective coronary arteriography used by virtually a hundred percent of the people in the world performing coronary angiograms. This is the x-ray evaluation of the blood vessels of the heart. I think of Dr. J. Wayne, J. Wayne McFarland, co-author of the five-day plan to stop smoking, has helped more than 20 million people around the world. I think of fetal monitoring that was invented by Dr. Edward Hahn uh, he became a full professor at Yale University, but he came back to La Melinda, and we became the first hospital in the world to routinely monitor deliveries. Now fetal monitoring has become a part of good obstetrical care in hospitals and clinics around the world. Then there's the infant heart transplant program. Dr. Leonard Bailey had a dream to save doomed babies. Now there have been around 350 babies under one year of age here in Loma Linda who have new hearts in them. And, and then there's the Proton Treatment Center. We've treated now 17,000 patients from around the world. And so our alumni have some big shoulders to stand on and some big footprints to fill. And I hope that they are inspired by our heritage as much as I am. I am particularly inspired by people who having the opportunity for personal gain mm -hmm. give up that gain mm -hmm. in order to benefit humanity. Mm -hmm. And you, you began your collection of examples mentioning the gentleman, and mm -hmm. I don't remember the name, mm -hmm. the gentleman that developed this cardiac mm -hmm. uh, technique. Can you remind us of the name? Yes, Dr. Melvin Judkins. Melvin Judkins. <coughs> he could have patented. He could have become this. extremely wealthy.
by just getting patents on his heart catheters. And, and everybody should understand what this means. Getting a patent means mm -hmm. that you have to pay royalties for using the procedure, the technique, the implement. You cannot simply take it as your own. But he did not do this. No. What did he choose to do? He chose to give this to medical science, to give this to mankind. And then one of his, uh, <coughs> one of the people that he recruited was Dr. James Slater. And, um, Dr. Slater and his team developed computer-assisted radiation therapy planning. And a lady from London, England stood up in a national meeting and she said, this is the missing link in radiation medicine. Dr. Slater got patents on his computer-assisted radiation therapy planning, but he never charged for them. He wanted mankind to benefit from that. So our students have choices. We all need to live a healthy life and to have comfort. I mean, you are well-dressed, I am also. Uh, so we're not looking at, at uh, starving. No. The options are not a starvation or philanthropy. Mm -hmm. The students have big shoulders to stand on. Not only these fantastic people who have done miraculous things, but all of the others that have done uh, smaller things that have been big for one individual at a time, but may not have come up in the news. They may not have come up with techniques that others will follow, but touching one person at a time mm -hmm. makes you famous with that one person. And you can choose. Would you be doing it for profit and looking for more opportunities to make a bigger salary, to have better benefits? And nobody's against those too. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose to live for mission and for mm -hmm representing the gospel, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And it has not meant for me want. I have not want. What do you recommend to our students and, and what ways can they see this come through? Well, hopefully those of us who are here today are an example. Um, I'm going to tell you something that mo many people don't know, mm -hmm. and that is that the faculty in this school of medicine, most of them do not receive a salary. Mm -hmm. The tuition would be much greater than it is now. And, and then we have uh, endowment funds that are designed to help those students who need help financially to become student physicians. But the clinical faculty do not get a salary from the School of Medicine. And they donate up to half time. Half of their time is spent teaching medical students clinical experience. What they live on is what they earn in their outpatient practices and possibly research grants. The people in the School of Medicine who get a salary would be administrators and people who teach in the basic sciences who have no other source of I mean, family income. So I mentioned that because that was an inspiration to me to yes. hear that. Indeed, indeed. Salary is the measurement of our worth in the world. Mm -hmm. That's how people look at us. Mm -hmm. And many attach value to money as the highest mm -hmm. form of defining who we are. But we're saying to our students, please do consider the possibility of defining your life by, by service and by following in the footsteps of Jesus. If you are a Muslim, if you are a Buddhist, if you are even atheist and you're still uh, one of our students and will become one of our alumnus and be part of the alumni of the school, you can still imitate Jesus. You can see Jesus either as a historical figure who did these things. I see him as my personal savior, and I invite you to consider that. But you don't have to see him as a personal savior. You can see him also as a philanthropist, as a humanist, as one who gave his life for the benefit of others. And there are many others that have done this. 
and we welcome you to this club. We welcome you to this is exclusive camaraderie of people who have come under the influence of a woman who had a dream. A woman who would not give up. A woman who raised her voice in board meetings. And she is Ellen G. White. Of course, we don't worship her. We don't see her as uh, a figure to be uh, followed because of who she was as a person. But she is indeed, using your phrase, giving credit where credit is due, the founder, with capital letter F, of this institution. And as such, you are indebted. And you are indebted to all those who are giving their lives to this institution. And we welcome you and we pray that you will be worthy of the service, which is the highest form of revenue. Any other words that you'd like to tell before we finish? Uh, two thoughts. <clears throat> One of my historian predecessors, Dr. Kel Reynolds, called her an intrepid little woman in a black bonnet mm. who coaxed and prodded the reluctant men of the cloth into purchasing this hill we call Loma Linda back in 1905 when there was no money in the site. The other thought is that as the historian, I have noticed that many of the classes, probably all of the classes, have had a motto or, or a saying or a theme, and one of them was one word. And it was over the backdrop, over the shell of the Loma Linda Bowl for a graduation ceremony. That one word was others. Mm. Thank you for sharing your heart mm, and giving us an opening into the window of your soul and your dreams. Thank you. And we cherish sharing a bike ride with a 10-year-old boy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>